All right, Amos chapter 5. I think I said chapter 4 on Sunday, but I was wrong. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Let's look at the first half here tonight. The message is entitled, Israel's Call to Repentance. Which clearly they didn't pick up for, you know. And pick up that call. They let it go to voicemail. So, verses 1 through 15. It says, Hear this word which I take up against you, a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She is she will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. For thus says the Lord uh, to the house of Israel, Seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, nor Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn, who turn just justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to the rest of the earth. Uh, he made the Pleiades and Orion. He turns the shadow of death into morning and makes the day dark as night. He calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He, he rains ruin upon the strong so that fury comes upon the fortress. They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you, you shall not drink wine from them. For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor, um, the poor from justice at the gates. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at, at that time, for it is an evil time. <coughs> Seek good and not evil that you may live, so that the Lord of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gates. It may be that the Lord of God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So, Father, we thank you, God, for your word and we, we ask even now, God, that you would help us to uh, take the, the uh, I guess, reminder or the, the prompting of the Spirit to, to really look at our own lives and to turn from our own wicked ways, God, that you might spare us the judgment that, that's to come if we continue down that path. And so I ask that you would help us to be wise and, and God, that you would help us to trust in, and put our faith in you in all things. Love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Amos, you guys know us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, um, has laid out the judgment that was to come upon the, the Gentile nations and the nation of Israel, um, but as a whole there, but uh, he's primarily uh, speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel because of their sins against the Lord. It wasn't as if Judah hadn't sinned. Judah was going to get their own judgment for what they were doing. That would have come later in 586 B.C. or something like that at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But here, uh, Amos, who is from Judah, who is from the southern kingdom, is speaking, you know, prophetically against the northern kingdom who is going to come under the attack by the Assyrian army. And so the sins of the northern kingdom have gotten so bad that even their women were getting into the act, um, which is usually the final step of demise in a nation. I mean, when the women become as bad as the men, that's horrible. And if you think that that can't happen here, it's already happening in our day. Women are just as bad, just as evil as men are in our day as they are, as they were in this day. You know, we expect men to be violent, ruthless, and oppressive but we don't expect that uh, from women because they're, you know, more often than not, the nurturers of society. I remember my kids were young, you know, my wife and I would talk and, and you know, I was always the, the yeller and the spanker and the whatever. And I would always try to just, look, you be the loving one because they need somebody to turn to, you know, they need their mom, you know, for me, they're gonna, they're gonna know 
justice, you know, from you, they need to know compassion and mercy, right? But, you know, they're the nurturers of society. And when they become as evil and as ruthless as the men, then all is lost. And that was the case here. I mean, we saw that earlier, right? And the, the, the cows of Bashan, right? I mean, they were, they were awful. They were oppressing the people, just like the men were. And we can see uh, this downfall um, in our own nation today as many women no longer uh, have a desire to protect their unborn children. It's just an inconvenience to them. So they lay them in the hands of Molech, only this time, instead of it being a fiery idol that they place it on, it's Planned Parenthood, you know? And it's just an awful thing. And so the women are just as care, you know, not caring as the men are in, in that instance. So the way in which the Northern Kingdom of Israel had begun uh, to treat the most vulnerable among them started as a gradual progression uh, away from the statutes of the Lord. Nothing happened like immediately and overnight. It's always a progression. Sin is like that in our own lives as, you know, we start out and we just kind of, oh, I'm just not going to read today. And then it turns into, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to go and do this today or I'm going to do that. And we get a little closer to the line before we know it, we're all the way over the line. And we don't even know. We're like, how did I even get here? You know, sin sin doesn't, the enemy just doesn't shock you with sin right in front of your face and say, take it, you know? He, he lures you in. You know, he's like, he's like, you know, the, the person out there fishing with the, with the lure, you know? I, I like to, to fish with a lure as opposed to bait because I, I find it more fun to be able to pull the lure through the water and, and do that than to just sit there going, okay, well, I'm going to sit here for two hours waiting for a nibble, right? And so that's what the enemy does. And it's a gradual progression away from the statutes of the Lord, uh, just as it happens for any God-fearing people. So there's no way that the United States here in the state that we're in right now, the condition that we're in, will escape the judgment of the Lord. There's no way. It, it, listen, if, if Israel here, his, his people that he loves, both northern and southern kingdom, did not avoid the judgment that was to come upon them, we won't either. But notice here, as we get into what we're talking about, he does spare some of them, right? So there will be those who are spared. There will be those, in fact, as we go through Mark, we're getting to the, the day of the Lord in Mark, right? Chapter 13 is what we'll be in on Sunday. It talks about some things there, and then it gets into, you know, the, the, the coming judgment and all of that that's coming. And, and so some will escape, but not all. There will be judgment here in the United States, guaranteed. it. So God is, ju is just... And he will always give those who once called upon his name an opportunity to repent and turn back to him. But he won't put off his judgment forever. He doesn't hold back forever. We may think he does because he hasn't judged us yet. Wow, it's been so many years, Lord, and you haven't judged me yet. I guess I've skated, right? I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. You must be good with it. But that's not the case. God has all the time in the world to judge. But what he really is seeking is repentance, a heart of repentance. Somebody who is willing to stand up and say, I will turn. I will go back to you, Lord. You remember that whole, you know, thing with, with Lot and with Abram, right? When they split and Lot saw the fields and how they were awesome. And he went there and he ended up in Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't, it wasn't like a full on thing. He saw the grass. It was great. He went. It tempted him because it was beautiful. Then he pitched his tent outside the gate. Then before you know it, he was in the gate. Then he was one of them, right? He was just like that. And, and Abram said, was talking to God, said, look, God said, I'm gonna destroy Sodom and, and Gomorrah. Get, you know, Lot needs to get out of there. And then he began to tell him, well, for a hundred people, would you do that? For 50 people, for 20, for 10? And God just finally had enough and said, get them out. There's no way. They're not going to change. Lot is the one. Lot and his family. And then even in that, Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, they left. And then as they're leaving, his wife's heart was to be in there, to be with them, to be in the midst of their sin. 
and she turned around with that longing look and she turned into a pillar of salt. While Lot probably had his daughters in a headlock and was walking with them with their <laughs> eyes closed, right? And his own eyes closed, how far am I gonna go? And so it's just that gradual progression that gets us into a place where we can't turn and then judgment is inevitable. The United States didn't turn into whatever it is right now overnight. It was only about 20 years ago in September on the 11th that we were all unified as a nation, right? Against one enemy. And we were all disgusted by what happened. Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives, everybody came together and viva the United States. Now that's not the right term, but you know what I'm saying, <laughs> right? And we were all one, we were all together. And then from that, it just took a little bit of time and then the fractures began to happen again. And now we've gone from a place where, you know, back in the 30s, and 40s, we couldn't stand communism to a place where people are embracing it openly. And there's fights going on, you know, and you can't speak the truth, otherwise they'll shut your, shut your social media account down. You can't have a difference of opinion, otherwise they call you, you know, tell you that you're, you're disseminating disinformation. <coughs> Excuse me. But much like in, in Amos day, you know, the United States is in that same place now. And now we have to decide what we're gonna do as a nation. Are we gonna continue on with the sins of our fathers or are we gonna do something else? Can you grab your bottle of water? <coughs> Excuse me, I gotta tickle my throat. So verses one through three, Amos laments over the judgment of Israel, which is important. He wasn't excited about it. He wasn't like, yes, right? Hear this word, which I take up against you, a, lamenta a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. <coughs> Excuse me. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, the city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. So again, Amos begins by taking up a lamentation against the house of Israel. Uh, this is the third word uh, spoken against Israel uh, by Amos. <coughs> Excuse me. In as many chapters, which is indicated by the phrase, hear this word, in Amos 3, 1, 4, 1, and here in 5, 1. <coughs> Excuse me, one second. <coughs> I got this tickle again. I'm getting rid of it. It has to make you cry first. <laughs> Where did it go away? Has to be. <coughs> it's like in the worst spot. Excuse me. I promise I'm not sick and I'm not dying. It's just <coughs> a weird tickle. meant to be some flowery sermon 
to make the house of Israel feel good uh, about what they were doing. It was a lamentation that was meant to shake up those who believed themselves to be saved from the Lord's judgment. Give a tissue. Sorry. Amos delivers this lamentation to the people, which is typically sung uh, at the funeral, funeral of prominent people in society or a loved one, which can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse one, uh, 17 and 18. Excuse me. This is going to be the be best Instagram video ever. So just <laughs> let you know that. 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Then David lamented with this lamentation over Saul. Do you have it up there? Uh, and over Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Indeed, it is written in the book of Jasher. So if you continue down in 2 Samuel there, you'll get the song. Like there's maybe six or seven verses. Too much to write down. Really didn't feel like singing it for you guys. So... I figure I'd let you look it up on your own later. So if you just finish out that chapter, uh, you can see the song of the bow that's there. We're also told about Jeremiah and how he lamented over the death of Josiah, uh, the king of Judah, because he was a good king. So he lamented. He, he, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, and he was sad that he had died. He became king, if you guys remember, when he was eight years old. So, and then he reigned for like 35 years. And that's 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 25 through 27. <coughs> Jeremiah also lamented for Josiah. And to this day, all uh, the singing men and the singing women speak of Josiah in their lamentations. They made it a custom in Israel. And indeed, they are written in the laments. Now the rest of the acts of Josiah and his good, goodness according to what was written in the law of the Lord and his deeds from first to last. Indeed, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. So the prophets also lamented the death of cities and nations, which is the case here with, Nath with, with Amos, right? That there was different types of lamentations. And so this was one that he sang because that the, the nation and the people had strayed so far from the Lord. And so, <clears throat> he takes up this lamentation against Israel during one of the most prosperous times in their history under the leadership of Jeroboam II. So, Jeroboam I is the one who led them down the path of idolatry. Jeroboam the second comes in, doesn't change anything, but now they're in one of the most prosperous times in their history. Remember the cows of Bashan? They were so fat. They were so, like, the, the, the land was so green and lush on the east side of the Jordan that they had so much and everything was so great. And, and yet, it, their time of prosperity was at a time when they were furthest away from the Lord. You ever notice that sometimes? In your greatest moments of like prosperity and when you're feeling the most comfortable is when you're the furthest away from the Lord sometimes and when you're struggling the most is when you're the closest to the Lord and it's weird how that works because you're asking the Lord to bless you for you know any kind of prosperity because you're tired of the struggle and yet the struggle is what keeps you close to the Lord Amos likens the house of Israel to a virgin, in verse 2, who has fallen into the sin by allowing herself to be defiled. Once you give up your virginity, you can never get it back. Even if you claim to identify as a virgin in our society today, you're not. You know, once, you, once, once it's gone, it's gone. It doesn't grow back. It, it, it isn't like a, you know, your hair. You can shave it off and then it grows back on top of your head in, in most cases. But Israel here was God's bride. She was the one that, you know, he, he was betrothed to in a sense. She was his people. <coughs> and then she went after foreign gods um, of the land and forsook, 
you know, that, that true love that God had for, for her, yet God was still willing to take her back, which reminds us of Hosea and Gomer, right? And the fact that Gomer was a, a harlot, she was a prostitute, that God told Hosea to go out and marry. And Hosea didn't really balk at it. He just, you know, kind of did what the Lord wanted him to do. And you can see that that story is likened to the way the, the, the people of the nation of Israel had, you know, committed idolatry on the Lord and they, they played the harlot. They went after foreign gods. And this is where Amos is at as well, telling the northern kingdom, look at all that you, God has done for you, all the all things he's blessed you with and you're, 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 you know, stepping out on him with, with all these other gods. God had loved Israel with an everlasting love, but she refused to show him love in return. Um, so because of that, he removed his hand of protection from her and allowed other nations to come in and abuse her. Again, this caused a great number of them to fall in battle and to be taken captive by the Assyrians. God has been faithful, always faithful, to warn his people. Uh, he warned them through Moses of the consequences of following after false gods in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 25 through 31. And when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and and make a carved image in the form of anything. Notice how it wasn't like, you know, if, it was when, <laughs> you know, when you do these things. And do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, and you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess, and will not prolong uh, your days in it but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods and work uh, the, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which, either, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. When... You are in distress and all these things come upon you in the latter days when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice for the Lord your God is a merciful God he will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them and so God humble his people in order to get them to turn and he would spare a tenth of them in one city uh, that city that goes out by a thousand having a hundred return and another by goes out by a hundred and ten return so he spares a tenth of them to the house of Israel as a remnant God is always faithful he's going to take care of his people he's going to lead them to a place like he does with us to where he can break us so that we can then be shaped into something else. It's like the potter, right? The, the clay in the potter's hands. The potter makes a vessel and something in it he just doesn't like. It's, it's marred in his sight. So he crushes it, he reshapes it, and molds it into something new. And, and sometimes it has to happen where we have to become so broken that God can actually put us back together again. He takes up the pieces of our life and restores us, puts us into, you know, some better way. I, I don't know if you guys have ever been through that, like a, a place where you've just been crushed or you feel like you have. And then just when you're down low and you think, oh, Lord, I can't take anymore, then there's just that one more little grind, right, where you're just smashed into bits. And then you're like, I'm good, you know? <laughs> You're tapping out, you know? And, and then God says, okay, now I can deal with you. Now I can reshape you. Now I can mold you into something new and something different. It's not a one-time event either. It's something that happens over the course of our lives, maybe more than once. 
because we're thick-headed and we don't learn uh, our lessons. You know, we, we always try and tell our kids, you know, hey, look, do it this way because I want you to avoid the mistakes that I went through. But the problem is we all continue to make those same mistakes, you know, and, and our kids have to make their own mistakes in life. You can't hold their hand through their whole entire life and lead them you know, around it, okay, don't touch that, you know, and tell little Johnny, don't touch that Johnny, and he's like 19 now, you know, it's like, no, Johnny's got to figure it out on his own. So in verse four through seven, God pleads with Israel to turn back to him. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, seek me and live, but do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live, lest he break out fire, like fire in, in the house of Joseph, and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel. You who turn justice to wormwood and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. <coughs> Excuse me. God calls on the house of Israel uh, to seek him. By forsaking their false gods. <clears throat> Give them up. The gods of Bethel, the gods of Gilgal, God promised to be found by all those who seek after him. In Isaiah chapter 55, verse 6 and 7. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. And God said, to, said this to Judah in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 through 14. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I thought, I know the thoughts that I, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil give you a future and a hope then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and I will and you will seek me and find me when you search me with all your heart I will be found by you says the Lord and I will bring you back from your captivity I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I've driven you says the Lord and I will bring you to the place from which I cause uh, you to be carried away captive so they had to pay back what they owed they had not let the land rest right for what was it 490 years or whatever it was i forget what it was so they had to pay 70 years, 70 years. To, to the lord math you guys remember my math when i thought 70 times 7 was 144 yeah yeah so we're gonna you know i know it's 490 now it's stuck in my head so they had to pay back what they owed and so God put them into captivity to Babylon for 70 years. And so God didn't, he didn't go too far with them. You know, he wasn't the type, he isn't the type to punish somebody beyond what they're due. He is going to exact judgment in a precise measure, you know? And so anytime we think sometimes that, Lord, this is too much for me to bear, you know, the, the stuff that you're putting upon me because I've sinned against you, it's too much. It's not, you know, you're going to get, I'm going to get exactly what's coming to me in terms of judgment. And you know, the temptation is coming, not coming to man. Right. That's right. Exactly. And God will be faithful and he is always faithful to give us a way out to, to not judge us to the point of crushing us. Anything he puts upon you to turn your life towards him, you can take and you'll be able to take and you would do well to take because from there, hopefully we'll learn what he's trying to teach us. So having a proper relationship with the Lord can only be had if we're willing to seek him. If we're willing to trust and follow after what he's doing in our lives and forsake those things that draw us away from him. 
forsaking the, the idols in the land was their deal, right? What's your deal? What's my deal? What is it that I need to forsake in order to have my relationship with the Lord be right? That I can, instead of getting the judgment that I truly deserve, see the merciful hand of the Lord as he holds off judgment because he sees me turning back, right? And, and then my ways are now directed and straight towards him as opposed to wherever I was deviating to in the path and, 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 and other times, right? So God calls on the house of Israel to forsake the convenient and the popular places of worship in Bethel, Gilgal, and Beersheba as they would lead to their destruction. Why? Because they had set idols up in those places to worship. They weren't supposed to worship there. They were meant to worship in Jerusalem. And because Jeroboam the first knew that if he allowed the people to go to Jerusalem, that they would turn back and follow King Rehoboam of the southern kingdom, because they knew they were supposed to worship there, that he would end up getting killed. They would put him to death. And because of that, his, whether it's jealousy, whether it's frustration, whether it's, you know, the fact that he wanted to be, I'm king and I want to continue to be king. He was prideful. Whatever it was, he wasn't willing to allow the people to worship where they were supposed to be worshiping. And so he set up these idols in these different cities and they went and worshiped there. God's telling them, don't do it anymore. <laughs> don't, don't, don't bother going there anymore. The name Bethel, you guys remember from earlier when we talked about this, means house of God. But it would later become known as Beth Avon, which means house of nothing. <laughs> so, I mean, there you go. Why? Because they were worshiping false gods. And it became nothing to them. It wasn't a big deal. You know, and so no longer are they following after the true and the living God, but the gods of the land. And they made something that was supposed to be glorious into something that was, you know, a joke. Something that was nothing. The former place that had, been special, had a special meaning for Israel would come to nothing because they were no longer seeking the Lord. And this would cause massive amounts of destruction in verse 6, as he says, in the house of Joseph. Was, which is a reference, if you guys remember, uh, to Ephraim. If, you, if we go back to Hosea again, right? Mm -hmm. Ephraim was considered the northern kingdom. Uh, the northern kingdom was known by many names, the house of Joseph, house of Ephraim, <coughs> right? I mean, and, and, and so you have these different, you know, they were called Israel, even though the whole nation was Israel. They were the northern kingdom of Israel, right? But Ephraim was the largest tribe, even though they were a half-tribe. They were the half-tribe of Joseph. The other tribe was Manasseh, right? And so because of that, you know, you, you have you know, massive amounts of destruction coming upon Israel and upon Israel's largest you know, tribe, which was actually a half-tribe. Again, God would bring judgment on the house of Israel because their sense of justice was perverted, he says, like wormwood in verse seven. Wormwood was bitter and corrupted everything that it got into. So if it got into the water, if it got into the food, it was just bitter. Everything was gross. Israel also viewed righteousness as something to be trampled on the earth, something underfoot, right? Something you would walk on or step all over. They were stepping upon God's righteousness and, and all the things that he had done for them. The righteousness of the people. All the things that they had were being trampled upon. Sounds like today. All your God-given, not government-given, constitutional rights are being trampled upon by a bunch of tyrants. And, and until you, the people... Me, the people, we, the people, stand up and tell the government who they work for, they'll continue to do it. And here as well, 
The people did not stand up against the leadership of Israel and say the reason why these things are coming upon us is because you are leading us down the path of destruction, following after all these false gods, when we should be following the true and the living God. And because they didn't do that, they were all like sheep to the slaughter. And that's what happens when good people do nothing, right? Who said that? Who, I forget who said that. You know, only they, I, I, for something for, I don't know, for, for something to happen, you know, good people, all that has to happen is good people do nothing for whatever, tyrants to take over or whatever that is. I'm butchering the whole entire thing, doesn't really matter. You get my drift, look it up, let me know later. So, God brings his judgment upon them. You know, and it was evident that judgment was coming. And the fact that they were trampling on, you know, righteousness by the way that they were living their lives. Verses 8 and 9, Israel's call to repent is from the creator of all things. The God who formed the heavens and hung them on nothing. He is the one that is going to bring judgment. His call is for them to repent. He made the Pleiades, he says, and Orion. He turned the shadow of death into mourning and <coughs> makes the dead, what do you call what I have? No, yeah. just kidding. And the day dark as night. Not good. Yeah, right. <laughs> he calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out on the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. He rains ruin upon the strong. So that fury comes upon the fortress. So Amos reminds Israel that it was their God who made the Pleiades and Orion, which here is a reference to the stars that can be found in the constellation uh, of Taurus, right? So he made all the stars in the sky. He made them. The things that you guys are worshiping and looking to and bowing down to, he made them. So why are you not bowing down and worshiping the one who made the things? But that's what happens, right? I think Paul said that. You know, uh, that, that we, we worship the creature rather than the creator who is blessed that forevermore, right? We worship things we shouldn't be worshiping. Again, the people of Israel were likely guilty of worshiping along uh, with the gods that they had carried away from Egypt, as we'll see in verse 26. As he gets down there in chapter 5, uh, verse 26 there, he says, you also carry Sikuth and your king and Chiun, your idols, the star of your gods. So they, they, they made these gods to worship the, the creation rather than the creator who made them. And so they, they brought all these things with them out of Egypt and they were going to worship them. God's the only one, he says in verse 8, who turns the shadow of death into morning and the day dark as night. And he also causes the waters of the sea to be caught up in the clouds where they're poured out on the face of the earth. So you get that whole, you know, the sea evaporates, the water, the, the evaporation, the evaporated water goes up into the air. You know, you, I don't know, this is all like, you know, probably stuff we all learned in like eighth grade or something like that. And then it goes up there and the condensation happens and then the, the, the clouds and all that, and then it rains, right? And we all are like, wow, it's raining, that's amazing, right? And so God is the one who does all that. He's the one who pours out the water on the face of the earth so that it uh, would not be difficult. It wouldn't be difficult for him to change the prosperity of Israel into poverty by removing his hand of protection from them and raining down ruin, as he says in verse nine, instead. He could bless them or he could destroy them. It was his to do. And, and the fact that they had all this wealth in the land and it was lush and green and it was raining and it was good and there was fat cows and all of this stuff was a sign of God's blessing, despite 
their own sinfulness. But at a certain point, God is going to remove his hand and judgment's going to come. And that's what was taking place here. God was like, I'm done. I'm done taking care of you. I'm done dealing. You guys aren't turning. I'm blessing you like crazy. And what are you doing? You're bringing your gods from Egypt and you're worshiping the sky. You know, people today worship the earth. Mother Earth, right? We need to take care of the planet. And listen, I'm going to tell you this, and this is not a statement of me endorsing global warming or anything. We are called to be caretakers of this planet, right? We're to take care of the planet. We're to be taking care of the animals and all of that. Problem is, sin entered in, and people do dumb things. People litter. People, I, I can't stand it when people litter. It drives me crazy if you're driving down the freeway and somebody throws a, some trash out the window. It, it drives me nuts. But not because I'm thinking to myself, that straw is going to end up in the turtle's nose. It's not that. It's because God created this place and we need to take care of it. It's much like this building, right? This building that we use for church. It's nice. Anything can be nicer. But even when the inside of this building was gross, you guys remember that when we first got here? When it was gross. And the chairs were gross and the carpet was gross and everything was like you didn't want to touch anything. Right? Even when it was like that, we took care of it because God provided it for us. Right? And it's the same thing with her. God takes care of us. He's provided this beautiful place for us. And what? We're just supposed to throw trash on the ground? Again, not hyping up global warming because we only have maybe 150 to 200 years of recorded weather <laughs> history, you know, on file. And yet everybody is ready to make assumptions about what the world was like thousands of years ago. You know? No. The, the fact that the, there is such thing as global warming, it happens all the time, or I should say not global warming, but climate change. The climate changes all the time, all the time. One day it's cold, the next day it's hot. One day it's raining, the next day, you know, it's sunny out. The problem is you get all these people, we were talking about it earlier, is you have this 24 hour news cycle where everybody's inundating you with garbage. And so we're all like, sounding boards all the time and we all just go out and make assumptions about things that we don't know anything about it's like propaganda he's a christian rapper who said you know all the stuff that we were ready to make claims about but science can't even explain yawning right i mean it's true <laughs> why do people yawn uh, why when i yawn do you yawn you know it makes no sense to me and it's true Debbie just yawned because I'm talking about it. Now we're all going to yawn. Now you're all going to yawn. See what I'm saying? I mean, this is just the way it is. We're ready to make assumptions about things when we don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. In verses 10 and 11, Israel hates to be corrected for their wrongdoing. They, they don't want it. They don't like it. Who likes to be corrected? Nobody. But it's good to be corrected, and we'll see that. In verse 10, it says, They hate the one who rebukes in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks uprightly. Therefore, because you tread down the poor and take grain taxes from him, though you have built houses of hewn stone, yet you shall not dwell in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink wine from them. So Amos points out Israel's hatred of the judge in verse 10 who rebukes at the gate. And, and witnesses who speak uprightly against them, right? The witnesses that are actually speaking the truth, they can't stand it because they don't like to be corrected. Hmm. Much like the Democratic Party today. <laughs> You tell them something that is factually true, and again, these same people are the ones who are telling you to go take this experimental drug while screaming up and down that my body, my choice in terms of abortion. My body, my choice in terms of what you're gonna put in it. 
The same people who are screaming about science deny the most elementary science of XXXY. It's insanity. The, word is, the world has become great. In fact, it, you know, read Mark chapter 13 as a lead up for the next couple weeks because that is a lot of what's going on today. Wars, rumors of wars, right? Pestilence, famine, all that kind of stuff. And it's all the lead up to the end. The end is around the corner. When is it? I don't know because no man knows the day or the hour and anybody who says they do, they're a charlatan. So Amos points these things out. We're given these words of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as the father of the son in whom he delights. It's good to be corrected because it lets you know that people love you. I wasn't really, you know, I was corrected some when I was younger, you know, by my, my grandmother who loved me. But there was a point in time in my life where I didn't get correction. And so I ran about the neighborhood doing whatever I wanted to do. And it was not good. And it, it, it showed that my, my mom at that time, when I was living with just her, did not care. She was too wrapped up in her own life to care about what I was doing at one and two in the morning at nine, 10, 11 years old. You know, I, it's, it's crazy. If you don't have that correction, how do you know if you're loved? It's the antithesis of love. Yeah. The fact that they were still, Israel here was still being rebuked, should have brought some type of joy to their lives. It should have made them think to themselves, God still loves us, he cares. We are not completely lost, right? Because it meant they weren't at that time too far gone. But that all changes. Instead here, they hate to be corrected. Not even by the judges at the gate, with witnesses who are speaking truth. They don't like it. Again, that speaks to many in our day who hate those who stand up for truth. The, el the wealthy here in Israel hates the rebukes because they were the ones making uh, money by oppressing the poor with excessive taxes in order to keep themselves prospering, in order, you know, to continue to be buying, you know, their, their own land, you know. They, they were renting their land out to these, these people who were planting grain and they were overtaxing them, but the people couldn't do anything about it because things were so expensive for them and they needed to plant and they needed to sow, they needed to harvest, right? And they had to pay these absor exorbitant taxes that they couldn't do anything about it. They were in this weird cycle where they couldn't, they, they didn't have enough money to get out from under where they were at because it was oppressive, but they had to stay in the oppression because they needed to make it the little that they were making. And, and when they brought this before the judges in Israel at the gate, and they spoke truth, the people that were overtaxing them hated it. They hated being called out, they hated being pointed to as people who were, you know, taking advantage of whatever the situation was at the time. They hated to be corrected. The law was clear that they were not to put heavy burdens on the poor, uh, or anyone else for that matter, actually. And we're told about that in Exodus chapter 23, verse one through nine. You shall not circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked or be uh, an, an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. Let's pause there for a second. Antifa and Black Lives Matter. And, and I'll throw in any kind of white racist people out there as well. So racism comes in all forms and all shapes and all colors. It's not solely white people. And so 
You're not to follow around this crowd who's going out to do evil. These mobs that are going out and they're destroying things or they're stealing and looting. You're not supposed to do that, especially as a Christian. If you're doing that as a Christian, what the heck is wrong with you? And so, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his disputes. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. So again, listen, you weren't to just say, well, that's my enemy's donkey, so I'm just going to let it go. You weren't to side with poor people only. You were to, you were to show, you weren't to be partial. You were to be, if you were going to judge or you're going to do something, you were supposed to do it or you're going to help somebody, you're supposed to do it across the board. Not because I like you or I don't like you. Because I know you, I don't know you. If you see the donkey of the one you hate, the one who hates you rather, uh, lying under its burden, and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help with it. You shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. Keep yourself far from a false matter. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. You shall not take a you, you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. For all of you who hold government office and have lobbyists at your door, right? Don't take bribes. Also, you shall not oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You, you can sympathize with them. You were oppressed in Egypt. You were strangers in the land, and you, 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 you look to try and get some sort of like help, and look what happened to you. You were oppressed, so why would you then oppress strangers who come into the land? No reparations. That's right, no reparations. The wealthy in Israel would not be able to enjoy the fruits of their dishonest gain because, he says in verse 11, their houses and vineyards would be taken away from them by Assyria. Assyria was wicked and vicious, and they would come in, and they would kill many, and then they would enslave the women and the children and take some of the men as slaves. And then they would come in and they would burn down everything and drive everything and trample it into the ground so that you, if you escaped or you were let go or something happened, you could not go back to that land and rebuild. That was the way they did things. And they were proficient at it. And God allowed this to happen. To Israel in 722 BC. And so in verse 12 and 13, God knows every sin that Israel committed. And that goes for you and me too, right? For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Therefore, the prudent keep silent at that time. For it is an evil time. So the judges of Israel here in verse 12 were afflicting the poor as they take bribes from the wealthy in order to subvert justice at the gates. Again, this is like, you could mirror this to the time we are living in now. As justices, people who are supposed to be impartial and they're supposed to follow the law, and those who are on the Supreme Court are supposed to follow the Constitution, and yet because of their political affiliation and the things that they deem to be you know, prudent and right, they subvert justice and continue up, taking us on this path where the only thing that's going to take place is God's hand of judgment upon us. And so they do these things. We're told in Micah chapter 6, verse 8, He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Those days in the United States are long past. We might as well prepare for judgment. Because listen, you and I might be willing to turn, and maybe there's some people who are willing to turn, and maybe we'll be that 10% that's spared, you know? But 
At some point, judgment is going to come. And while you and I are not going to sit under God's wrath, as we'll also see in Mark chapter 13, because before the tribulation and great tribulation period, you and I will be out. And so while we don't receive God's wrath, the Bible doesn't say anything about us not getting some of the judgment that's to come. Know your theology, read your Bible, because if you think we're gonna escape any kind of judgment, you're sadly mistaken. And so, God desires for his people to show mercy to others, just as he has done for them. But they were more concerned about money and popularity and all those types of things than they were about their own brethren. Those who sit in judgment are to distribute judgment according to the law and not their own ideology, which doesn't happen very much these days. Everybody's got an agenda. So the poor knew that they weren't going to win against the rich in verse 12 here, so they kept silent because it was an evil time. It, it, was, a, it was an evil time to live in. And so the prudent among those just shut their mouths and just said, look, I mean, it's going to get way worse if I say something. And that's sad. Isn't that kind of what it feels like at times? It seems like Within the past, I don't know, let's say, let's call it six months, but really it's less than that, that people are speaking out more against craziness like CRT and all this other nonsense that's going on in the schools, against being called bigots and racists and homophobes because you stand for something, you know? Uh, people are speaking out against that kind of stuff. And, and I like it because it really shows that people are starting to get a backbone. But here, you know, <laughs> we had been oppressed for so long that it was just prudent for us to stay quiet. You know, we were always called what? The silent majority, right? Not anymore. You're gonna have a big mouth, I'm gonna have a big mouth. You know, and we can go back and forth on who's got the biggest mouth. But the days of standing silent and let people trample all over you and over me are over. And that scares those who are in power right now, which is why they're trying to strip away your and my First Amendment rights. And, and, and they let it slip because Biden is not of sound mind. And so he let it slip that they're working in conjunction with social media to silence conservative voices. You could say they let it slip or maybe God let it come to be known, you know, but well, that we'll see what happens. But that's not constitutional, my friends. The government cannot work in conjunction with private companies to silence your voice. It is not constitutional. And so let's see, because there's a few constitutional lawyers out, right, out there right now that are actually putting things forward and they are dealing with the situations that have just come up. Don't let your voice be silent. So now I understand maybe there's situations that we get in that, you know, call for us to stand down because you're outnumbered and it feels unsafe. And that would be where it would be prudent to not say anything. But there are situations where God calls you to step up and say something. You become the Esther of your day, where you were born for this time. And there are many out there right now that I feel that are truly called and born for this moment and this time to speak out against the things that are going on. Candace Owen is one of them. Great, I mean, her, Charlie Kirk, I mean, some of these, they're just phenomenal when it comes to speaking truth and being concise and clear about it. And I applaud those people. And, and as many times as I can like them on Instagram, I'll do it, you know? Mm -hmm. and so anyway, the poor knew they couldn't win the, from these rich people. So at this time in Israel's history, they stayed silent because it was a prudent thing to do. We're told this concerning those who do evil in verse, uh, Isaiah chapter five, verse 20. 
Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitterness for sweet and sweet for bitterness. Woe to you for doing that. Woe to you for calling good evil and evil good. When you dare to say to a, a, a woman in front of a Planned Parenthood, hey, choose life. Your mom chose life for you, choose life. Or give the baby up for adoption. Or before you do that, let's go see a sonogram. Planned Parenthood does not want women to see the sonogram of their baby because nine times out of 10 when they see the sonogram, they do not have the abortion. And that is not the plan of Planned Parenthood. In fact, the woman who started Planned Parenthood was a racist and a bigot. She wanted to prevent black people from having children. That's who she was. And she's dead now, likely in hell, because I don't believe she repented, but then again, I don't know, and I'm not the judge of that. Maybe we'll find out one day. But if I had to take a guess. So the word woe is synonymous with the judgment of God, which means that those who call evil things good and good things evil will be judged by God. You know, and, and we want to be on the right side uh, of that, you know, argument. When something is evil, we need to point it out and call it evil. And when something is good, we need to point it out. And that's what's right in God's eyes. In verse 14 and 15, God once again here, calling Israel to change their ways. All the things that Amos is talking about, and how many times over chapter three, four, and five here, that he is like, look, judgment's coming. This is what's coming, chapter two. In Judah and Israel, the chapter one, and part of chapter two, the judgment of the Gentile nations, right? All the things that were coming, and here, God still is trying to beg and plead with his people to turn. Seek good and not evil that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. And so God gives the people of Israel a command. He says, do the right thing, which is probably where Spike Lee got it, right? Do the right thing. <laughs> Do the right thing, which is to seek good and not evil, so that you can live. God did not want to destroy or put bring judgment upon his people. He was begging and pleading with them, stop. Stop turning towards evil. Seek what's good. <coughs> that you can live. So should the people choose to listen to the Lord, they would live in eternity with him. And he would be with them while they lived, protecting them, having his hand upon them. But they didn't, which forced him to remove his hand of judgment, or his hand of protection, right? Which opened them up for judgment, right? God knew what would happen if he took his hand away from them. That protection, right? Oh, what, who was it? Oh, so-and-so only follows you because you, you know, you, you trust, uh, Job, right? Yeah. And it was, it was Job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he only follows you because, you know, you protect him and keep your hand upon him. And so he says, okay, go ahead. You look, <clears throat> do whatever you want to him, only don't kill him. Don't take his life. So Satan just went after him, right? And what did Job do at the end? Naked I came into this world, naked I'll leave, you know? I mean, God, God has blessed him beyond measure. And he understood that it's only because God was blessing him that he even was there living, that he was able to have his life because God was there watching over him. And even with all the boils and all the other things that started to come upon him, I mean, he got pretty upset with the Lord, I think, at one point. Oh, he 
said, even Lord, if you slay me, yet I will trust in you. Right. <laughs> so he did not let his anger or his frustration at his situation turn into him impugning God in his character. Should I receive the blessings from the Lord and not the, the, the cursings or whatever you might say, right? All the good things I'm going to take from the Lord, but none of the bad. Lord, that bad? No thanks, Lord. Give me all the good stuff, right? The bad stuff comes upon us so that you and I can grow and mature. Do we want bad stuff? I don't want bad stuff all the time. I don't want to grow and mature that much, you know? But just enough, Lord. And, and when it's time, when I've had enough, and you know when I've had enough, give me a little bit of a breath before we move on to the next, you know, thing, right? So God is quick and eager to forgive. But as he says in verse 15, we need to hate evil and love good. We need to reject the evil that comes upon us from this world. We, look, you should not be convinced by the different people and factions in this world that want, that are fighting, vying for your attention, vying for your attention, right? That, that want you to follow after them, no matter who it is, whether it's, you know, any kind of extremist group, no matter where they're at, whether they're white, black, or, or otherwise, we shouldn't be following after the world. You and I are on God's team. And we should be walking and, and living our lives according to his purposes and his plans and not loving evil while hating good. We need to hate evil and love good just as much as he does. People need to turn from their sin and reestablish justice at the gate because they allowed things to, to deteriorate to the point here of no return, which is just the truth of the matter. They'd gone too far. God still was willing, but the people weren't willing. If they would have done what the Lord asked them to do, then he would have been gracious or would be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. <coughs> we in the United States of America have an opportunity to get right with God, to change our ways. It needs to start, let me say this clearly, it needs to start in the church first. Christians who are pro-abortion, we kind of talked about that a little bit on Sunday. If you're pro-abortion, you believe in you know, all this liberal ideology and all the things that are going on. You believe in CRT and the 1619 Project and all this other <coughs> nonsense, you need to repent. I have no other, no other way to say it than that. You are not to be on the side of people in the world. You are to be on God's side. And God does not see people the way you and I see people. So if we have to choose between viewing things in the world like the world does or viewing people as sinful beings like God does, I'm going to choose God's side every time. And that's what we need to do. And if you're following after, being deceived by, maybe you're, I don't know, maybe you're even caught up in it. To the point where you're, you know, upset with other Christians who don't think the way you do, then you need to repent. You need to read your Bible. And you need to change. And if you want to stop the things that are going on in the world, like all of us do, the best way to do that is to walk with God. To trust Him. To know that He doesn't view things in the world like you and I do. And he wants us to align ourselves with him and his word and not with the world, right? And so we need to get right with God before judgment comes. But that means we need to give every part of our lives to him. Even the dark and shameful parts, the parts you admit to nobody, the private things that are between you and the Lord. And I believe that if we're willing to do this, 
if I'm quite honest, I believe that judgment will still come. But I believe that it will be pushed back. We'll have more time to minister the gospel to people. And if you're screaming at people because they don't believe what you believe concerning all the racial tension in the world right now as a Christian, then you are wasting your time. You need to be talking to people about Jesus. And that despite all the horrible things that, that they may be going through or that you have gone through, that there is hope beyond this. But we need to stop fixating on the evil things and start looking at the good things that God is doing. And we need to repent. And that starts first in the house of God. And then it disseminates from there. So Father, we thank you for this time. And you gotta know it can be a real struggle, Lord, as we get so consumed with all the instantaneous news and the things that are going on and how it can be very difficult, Lord, to discern the truth at times, God, and, and when we need to maybe unplug and just get away from it so we can refocus our efforts on your word and what your word says. It's important. So, Lord, I, I pray for those who maybe struggle, God, with you know, all the, the racial tension that goes on right now. Man, I, I hate to see that. I hate to see that in, in my brothers and sisters in the Lord and all the things that are, are, are going on and what they're taking to heart. God, it's so much more important that we focus on your word. God, you can't fix every problem in the world. But, or we can't, I should say, you definitely can we can't fix every problem in the world and you haven't called us to what you have called us to do is to preach the gospel because the good news that Jesus Christ came and died for our sins and rose again the third day is what will heal the woes of this world and so God I pray that your word would permeate our hearts and that it would turn us God away from the things that are sinful and turn us to the things that are good. And so, Lord, I, I lift this to you, and I pray that you would bless each and every one of us, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you enjoyed this message and would like to donate to Rush Church Ventura, please visit our website at rushchurchventura.com. Again, that's rushchurchventura.com.